Hi, welcome to the uh, YouTube channel of The Wire. My name is Devi Rupa Mitra, the Deputy Editor and Diplomatic Correspondent for The Wire. Uh, we are here to basically discuss the ongoing crisis in the Gulf, where on Monday, four countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt, and uh, Bahrain, had cut diplomatic ties with Qatar, saying that Qatar is supporting extremism and terrorism. Uh, for India, it is a very important region because it has implications for energy security and we have 5 million Indian diaspora uh, living and working in the region. Uh, we have with us Mr. Talmiz Ahmed, who is a very experienced and uh, a former Indian ambassador in the region. He had two uh, important stints in Saudi Arabia as India's ambassador, as well as to Oman and, um, and to UAE. So I don't think there's anybody else who can perhaps throw some light on what exactly is the background and the fallout from this uh, crisis. So can I just ask you, first of all, to basically look back. Uh, this crisis started after the current, I don't know if I can call it a crisis right now, because it's just two days, right? Um, it started after there was a, a Qatari news agency report about a speech by the Qatari Emir, in which he supposedly uh, criticized the uh, US. He criticized. Um, the uh, Gulf policy, and he talked about the support for Hamas, and uh, also talked about Iran. Basically, that it is, uh, it is basically going against the Gulf's policy on Iran. Um, can you basically? Uh, but you have seen that there has been always an ongoing tension between Qatar and the Gulf over the over the years. Did you, as a as an experienced commentator, as a watcher of the region, did you expect developments to go so fast or to reach this peak um, uh, in this current uh, after the Qatari news agency report? Yes. yes. See, Qatar has been a bit of a maverick in the region. It's a very small country. It has the world's largest per capita income. It has the largest gas reserves in the world. It's one of the smallest countries in the world as well. And yet, it has adopted positions traditionally that have been unique as far as the region is concerned, as far as the, as far as the GCC is concerned. This has been their practice for several years. There is no ready explanation as to why Qatar takes these positions. It is when the rest of the GCC is concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood, they have been very closely affiliated with the Muslim mm -hmm. Brotherhood. At a time when, in the last few years, Saudi Arabia and others, a few other GCC countries have turned against Iran. Uh, I mean, Qatar has been wanting to engage with Iran. Uh, they also have good ties with Israel. They have very good ties with the United States. One of their senior leaders once explained that Qatar is a small country but it wants to open windows to everyone in the world. Mm -hmm. They are technically, doctrinally, a Wahhabi state. Mm -hmm. But they have pointed out that they, their Wahhabiya is moderate and it is accommodative, clearly indicating how different they are from Saudi Arabia. So they have very frequently irritated Saudi Arabia and some of the other GCC partner. But more recently, situation between, uh, you know, between uh, them and the rest of the Gulf partners have become more serious. But after the Arab Spring, Qatar supported the Muslim Brotherhood and supported the Morsi government. So at once, it alienated three major Arab countries, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt. Egypt under General Sisi. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at one time, major Arab countries also withdrew their ambassadors in 2014 because Qatar was accused of giving sanctuary to Muslim Brotherhood members when other countries had declared the Brotherhood as a terrorist organization. So they withdrew the members. At that time, Qatar. Uh, indicated that it would deport those members and indeed some of them left Qatar and went to Turkey. So they have always had a position that has been different. What has happened recently is a direct result of the visit of President Trump 
to Riyadh, where he had a bilateral summit with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. He had a summit meeting with the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. And then he had a third meeting with major Islamic countries, at which Iran and Syria were not invited. But the most important country, the most important encounter that President Trump had was with Saudi Arabia. In their dialogue and in the agreements that followed, a very solid strategic partnership has been established between the two, which means that the United States has very solidly anchored itself in the Saudi, I mean, in the Saudi alliance the Saudi team against Iran. The joint statement makes very, very aggressive remarks against Iran, accusing it of fomenting, uh, you know, have, of having hegemonic aspirations, of promoting terrorism, of pursuing a ballistic missiles program that threatens the security of the region, etc. So the United States under, General, under President Trump has fully accepted the negative views relating to Iran that are, uh, that are accepted by Saudi Arabia. So the United States, instead of being a source of stability and security in the region, as they attempted to be under President Obama, seem to have gone back to the bellicose uh, scenario that we saw during the Bush presidency. Mm -hmm. So this is what has happened. What Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad, the ruler of Qatar, did when he went back two years later at a public gathering, at a military parade, he made certain remarks that undermined the Saudi position and the Saudi-US agreement totally. Mm -hmm. This is the most important point. Now, the Qataris have said that, these, that their sites were hacked and there no such me remarks were made, but other Gulf uh, you know, media persons have said that these remarks were on the official sites well before the denial. They were already being said. Yeah, they had been, been read already. It's only now that they have been removed. In any case, many of the Gulf uh, commentators noted that what Sheikh Tamim said in fact reflected traditional Qatari positions. He said that we cannot stigmatize Iran. Iran is a major regional player and a very important Islamic country and you therefore have to engage with Iran and have good relations with Iran. He praised Hezbollah and Hamas as uh, very important resistance groups in the region. This is particularly offensive to Saudi Arabia that sees Hezbollah as a terrorist organization promoting the Iranian agenda in Syria. Then he also with, he did not criticize the United States, I should clarify mm -hmm. that. He criticized, he noted that Saudi Arabia has come to depend far too much on President Trump, who is very insecure politically at home. He has serious political, that was the point he made. He otherwise said that he has good relations with the United States, he has good relations with Israel, and is open to all kind of constructive relationships. So the message that he was attempting to give was a positive and constructive message. Right? Now, in the scenario that prevails in the region, and particularly the situation that has emerged just after the Trump visit, this is totally unacceptable to Saudi Arabia. Now, Saudi Arabia is now much more buoyant, much more self-confident because the United States has pledged total support to the Saudi agenda, to the Saudi position in the region, to the Saudi postures in, across the region where they are competing with Iran. So Saudi Arabia is today, where earlier they used to have issues with uh, the Qataris, they were upset, they would recall ambassadors, but this kind of aggressive, high-profile, extremely you know, virulent campaign against Qatar is quite without precedent and has to be linked with the nexus that has been established between the United States and Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. So, 
So in this, what you are witnessing today is the first tremor in West Asia following on the Trump visit and what American commentators have started referring to as the Trump doctrine for West Asia. This is where we are today in the region. So the Trump doctrine is basically totally dependent on its uh, strategic partnership with Saudi Arabia. Th that is the key. That is the fundamental point. They have three or four points. The first point is that they are against terrorism. So terrorism as represented by Al-Qaeda and the Islamic State. Number two, they have built up an Islamic force against terrorism, in which is being seen as or referred to as the Sunni NATO or Arab NATO because no Shia country is included in it. Uh, number three, they have held Iran responsible for the instability and violence in the region as a whole. In all of this, this entire doctrine is anchored firmly in the relationship that the United States has set up with Saudi Arabia and Saudi Arabia's closest allies in this regard are the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Bahrain. This is a very powerful conclave. Saudi Arabia would like other Arab and Islamic countries to also come on board. But unfortunately, as of now, it would appear that a number of countries, while united against terrorism, are extremely uncomfortable with the hostility being articulated against Iran on the one hand and the sectarian structure that has been given to this confrontation. Because all countries, all countries in the world, uh, all Muslim countries have very significant minorities of other sects. In the case of Bahrain and Iraq, uh, you have Shia majorities and all the other countries have significant Shia communities. In the case of Saudi Arabia itself, you have 10% of the Saudi population is Shia, which would take you to at least 2 million people. In India also, we have about 10% of our Muslim population is Shia. In the case of Pakistan, more than 20% of Pakistan is Shia. Of course, you have a Shia majority in Iran, we know that. So, nobody is comfortable, no country is comfortable with the sectarian aspect. Again, no country wants to be associated in an alliance that is so avowedly, so robustly anti-Iran. Iran is a very important country in regional and world affairs, both on account of its civilization, on account of its economic stature, on account of its energy resources, and the role that it is capable of playing in regional affairs. So they would all want to see a situation where this divide between Saudi Arabia and Iran is bridged. Unfortunately, the United States, in the shape of President Trump, has aggravated the divide rather than promoted stability. So, uh, this kind of uh, pressure that the Saudi Arabia has brought on uh, Qatar has happened before. It happened in 2014. Not in exactly the same way, okay. but yes, that time they had withdrawn their diplomat, their yeah. ambassadors. It has happened mm -hmm. twice, to my knowledge. Now, once, once in early uh, part of the last decade, mm -hmm. uh, where the Saudis had a complaint against Al Jazeera. Mm -hmm. Al Jazeera had carried some remarks made by Saudi dissidents in London mm -hmm. that had been that had consist that had been disparaging mm -hmm. of the founder of the modern Saudi right. Kingdom, King Abdulaziz mm -hmm. bin Abdul Rahman. That was one. Mm -hmm. At that time, they had withdrawn their ambassador, and indeed, their ambassador remained out of Doha for several years mm -hmm. till about 2008 or yeah. 2009. In 2014, again, ambassadors mm -hmm. were withdrawn. And at that time, the Saudis were joined by Bahrain and UAE and possibly Kuwait. Mm -hmm. I don't remember now, because uh, they, they had accused Doha of harboring uh, certain uh, Brotherhood people. But no sanctions were announced. Mm -hmm. What is different this time is a whole range of sanctions, crippling sanctions, I would say, do recall that Qatar is an island nation, mm -hmm. therefore all communication and transport links with Qatar mm -hmm. have been banned. Qatar receives a lot of foodstuffs 
uh, across uh, from various neighboring countries mm -hmm. that has been blocked its air links it's uh, it can no longer use the air passage mm -hmm. uh, i mean you know it cannot use the air space yes. of the neighboring countries mm -hmm. it cannot land its aircraft cannot land in neighboring countries it is horrendous this is a kind of it's near it would be as powerful an assault upon another country that you can put together mm -hmm. and uh, it has serious implications i mean for example uh, qatar has been told not to uh, to remain involved with the gcc coalition that is fighting the houthis in uh, in yemen mm -hmm. in, and on the very day qatar had announced that six of its soldiers have been badly wounded mm -hmm. in the fighting they are doing on behalf of yemen mm -hmm. in the and they have been asked to leave mm -hmm. so these are there are symbolic actions there are severe economic sanctions there are very there is every attempt to isolate this island nation mm -hmm. and again i would like to remind you that there is something even more serious brewing mm -hmm. there are briefings being given by unnamed uh, gcc interlocutors to the media mm -hmm. and people have started writing about it saying that the gcc is going to carry out a very well planned Please. subversion you're against talk, iran you talk okay I'll... against iran uh, by instigating their ethnic minorities mm -hmm. and uh, there is also a hint mm -hmm. that they will attempt to change the qatari attitude the, yeah the is it uh, you they basically they hinting at regime change is that what they well i don't want to go ahead of myself in such a sensitive area mm -hmm. but yes you are right it is very surprising that 200 descendants male descendants mm -hmm. of sheikh uh, uh, of sheikh Fongil. ibn you know of sheikh mohammed ibn abdur rahman uh, has uh, sheikh, uh, sheikh, sheikh abdul uh, sheikh uh, sheikh mohammed i'm sorry i have to start this portion you can edit uh, no yeah. we can be going live huh? uh, so uh, sheikh uh, mohammed ibn abdul wahab the uh, whose doctrines mm. inform mm. the saudi uh, states mm. doctrines mm. Uh, the they have denied that the qatari royal family are descendants yeah. of their revered ancestor and uh, observers have seen in this attack mm -hmm. a questioning of the legitimacy of the athani royal family mm -hmm. and uh, therefore you uh, the most that i could say at this stage mm -hmm. is that a major attempt is being made mm -hmm. uh to to get the qatari leadership to reverse the positions that they have articulated and to end their maverick posturing that has been apparent for at least 15 or more years mm -hmm. now this is where we are today mm -hmm. the arab campaign against qatar is supported by a very powerful grouping in the united states as well mm -hmm. uh, this is a this is called uh, the uh, the foundation for the uh, uh, for the development of the dem uh, dem for the for the defense of democracies okay. fdd it is a hard right organization mm -hmm. very close to the extreme right wing mm -hmm. in israel mm -hmm. so it's a zionist organization and the leaks that we have seen today mm -hmm. of emails exchange mm -hmm. between the uae ambassador in washington and sections of the fdd suggests that there is a very very close nexus mm -hmm. between uae and uh, the fdd mm -hmm. and uh, there has been a coordinated assault mm -hmm. from the fdd on qatar mm -hmm. uh, with the knowledge of certain gcc countries with the knowledge approval and indeed full some support from the gcc country so you have a very peculiar scenario that while qatar is seen as a valued partner of the united states as a military partner and as a partner against terrorism there are sections right wing section the neocon sections in the united states closely affiliated with the kingdom and with the uae who are questioning qatar's credentials in this regard and hence a scholar has now referred to two qatars mm -hmm. which qatar are we to deal with the qatar that is our valued partner mm -hmm. or is it the qatar that is 
a maverick and that very frequently is uh, seen to be cohabiting with extremists. For example, the statement that the kingdom has made uh, just now uh, refers to uh, refers to Qatar supporting Al Qaeda, the Islamic State, Hezbollah, and all the other extremists supported by Iran. Mm -hmm. It's, I think, a very, very tall order. Mm -hmm. Then certain sections of the American media have said that Qatar is very weak on 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 combating uh, financing of terrorism. Yes. That has come out, mm -hmm. and again, in that way, the Qatari credentials mm. in the war against terror are being questioned by the extreme right wing. People who have been much more cautious about this are the Secretary of State mm. and the National Security Advisor. For them, this split in the GCC is a matter of deep regret and concern mm. because their primary concern is the war against terror, as mm. they say. But Qatar is not their partner in the war on Iran. Right. So you have a scenario where the Qataris, where I would imagine that Iran would, that uh, the United States would not mind a certain degree of pressure upon Qatar and seek a change in the positions mm -hmm. that Qatar has adopted. But I must also make one more point to you in this context. Mm -hmm. The United States has announced the appointment of a senior intelligence operative who has been active against extremism and violence in the past and had been in the CIA leading the, the search for Osama bin Laden. He has been made the head of Iran operations so that the Saudi, the, the Saudi UAE and other partners plan to subvert Iran as announced by some of their unnamed officials has now got full American backing mm -hmm. and to carry out subversion of ethnic, you know, by, by rousing unrest among ethnic minorities. The, the, I mean, there is a certain degree of bravado in this. But this interlocutor, unnamed, speaks of uh, um, the GCC encircling Iran. Mm -hmm. And our encirclement of Iran will be far stronger than anything that the Shia crescent might do. Mm -hmm. And we will go and they have named some of the countries that will support them. As you know, Iran is a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. It has a large number of minorities, like all big countries in the region, large number of minorities. And here you find a neighbor who is publicly announcing that they are going to agitate uh, the, uh, no, and they are going to encourage unrest with the Baluchis and with the Kurds and the Azeri. Which is very funny in a way because if you see the recent Iran elections, Rouhani got the highest votes perhaps in Sistan, Baluchistan, yes. uh, the, which is the, has the highest uh, rate yeah. of minorities in uh, Iran. In I share your skepticism. I'm not worried. I don't think Iran is so fragile. Mm -hmm. It has suffered 40 years mm -hmm. of sanctions and abuse mm -hmm. at the hands of the West, and it is still able to run its system. What has the West not done against them? What has the region not? You remember this extremely destructive Iran-Iraq war? Mm -hmm the use that uh, half a million of the people killed. Uh, you also remember the bombing of their cities, the use of chemical weapons against the Iraqis, which had been supplied from Western sources. Yes. And then the United States vetoed a resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, they vetoed a discussion mm -hmm. on the use of chemical weapons by Saddam Hussein against the Iranians. They have remained a resilient, a united entity. I am not sure this kind of this kind of activity is going to undermine them. I am not concerned about that. I am concerned about the I am concerned about the progressive instability, insecurity, confrontation, animosity, violence in our neighborhood. So can I ask you, UAE is the second largest supplier of natural gas in the world, and it also supplies. Uh, it has a supplies gas to its neighbors. I think it has a long pipeline, do dolphin pipeline. You're talking to about UAE. Iran. You're talking about I'm Iran. talking about uh, Qatar. 
right? Uh, Qatar. Uh, and its links, energy links. So does it have any kind of leverage, uh, economic leverage or energy leverage with its neighborhood? See, it, no, no. The neighboring countries of Qatar are themselves rich in gas, mm -hmm. uh, except that many of them, particularly Saudi Arabia, they no longer wish to export gas. Right. They want to use their gas as a fuel to diversify their economy mm -hmm. and develop petrochemical sector, mm -hmm. the fertilizer sector, glass sector, all of which need gas because of this high calorific value. Mm -hmm. Similarly, with regard to the UAE, mm -hmm. uh, there is no leverage here. Mm -hmm. The main markets for Qatari gas is are India Japan, and Korea and India and China. Mm -hmm. So these are the main, Japan and Korea in fact totally depend on Qatari gas. Mm -hmm. And Qatar has become such a rich country because of the uh, of uh, the Northeast Asian markets and now Indian market. Qatar is has every reason to be sensitive about its relationship with Iran because the gas field, the offshore, is shared with Iran. So obviously they would not like to be in a situation of confrontation or conflict because their entire economy based is based on a shared gas field. But that is not the only reason. I think that Qatar, as it has evolved, has certain positions and principles that set it apart from its other GCC partners. But it is much more vocal about it. Oman too, let me remind you, tends to take positions which are not part of the mainstream Saudi-led alliance. Indeed, you will recall that Oman facilitated the U.S.-Iran uh, uh, dialogue. Kuwait, if you see their location, mm. they are between three major countries, Iran, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. And they have not yet joined the... Uh, they will not join, join this. Their approach has, because of this, surrounded by three major powers, three major powers, Qatar has been very proud of its diplomacy. Mm. Sheikh Sabah Al Ahmed, their Amir, used to be the foreign minister, mm. Uh, and was indeed the longest serving foreign minister in his time. Uh, his entire effort is to promote reconciliation and dialogue. Mm -hmm. He is the one who led the GCC peace initiative to Tehran uh, some months ago and presented to the Iranian leadership uh, some of the conditions that, would, that, are, that are sought by the GCC in order to take uh, the peace process forward. And the Iranians indicated that while they don't like preconditions, they would be happy to be part of a peace process. And indeed, you have seen uh, Rouhani has made several statements about peace with the neighborhood. His own foreign minister has constantly stretched out his hand. With regard to the Gulf, with regard to the GCC, their concern is, it's a legitimate concern from their point of view, is that Iran's influence in the region even during the sanctions period, seems to be expanding. Expans Saudi Arabia is alarmed. Mm -hmm. Iran is a much larger country. It has 80 million people versus 20 million in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Iran uh, seems to have good relations with a large number of Arab countries. So there is a sense of strategic vulnerability in Riyadh. Mm -hmm. What the precondition that they have put forward is that Iran should play no role whatsoever mm -hmm. in the region, what they call interference. Right. Now, as you know, Iran did not expand its interference, its role, its mm -hmm. influence mm -hmm. actively. It's the beneficiary of certain policies that the Americans did. Mm -hmm. the, de the destruction of the Taliban regime mm -hmm. was one great boon to the Iranians on this border, mm -hmm. on the eastern border, and the destruction of the Saddam Hussein regime was a boon to the Iranians on their western border. So they are beneficiaries of actions that were done by, by some other role players. Mm -hmm. It's not as if they aggressively entered uh, Kabul or aggressively entered Baghdad. Mm -hmm. Now once you had the, it's the Americans who then focused on the sectarian empowerment, mm -hmm. the empowerment of Shia, not the Iranians. Mm -hmm. Now once you have structured Iraqi politics on the basis of a sectarian structure, Obviously, you are going to see a situation where Iran is a beneficiary uh, of this uh, situation. 
with regard to hezbollah hezbollah is confined to lebanon and is only confronting uh, it's only israeli. confronting the israelis and israeli uh, attacks upon lebanon mm -hmm. it has not sent its forces out of lebanon lebanon is confined it to lebanon it sends rockets uh, across. rockets are uh, called go from hamas mm -hmm. hamas has been the active role player but they are part of the occupation mm -hmm. they are in gaza mm -hmm. so hezbollah is a fairly robust force it's mm -hmm. a powerful force mm -hmm. and it's the one force the israelis actually respect mm -hmm. and they see in hezbollah a mirror image of themselves mm -hmm. high level of commitment mm -hmm. high level of discipline Uh, willing to take uh, uh, casualties mm -hmm. total commitment to the cause mm -hmm. exactly what the israelis see so the so exactly what the israelis do so the israeli effort consistently has been to emasculate the hezbollah who they see as their principal threat at their border mm -hmm. but hezbollah has no aggressive interest they do not wish to go uh, out of lebanon they are confined to lebanon but you will recall in 2006 the israelis launched a massive assault upon hezbollah and hoped to uh, hope to destroy hezbollah physically by killing as many people as possible they did not mm -hmm. they killed a very large number of civilians certainly several thousand of them but in from that assault hezbollah came out looking good mm -hmm. it was seen as one arab force mm -hmm. that has got the courage to stand up to the israelis mm -hmm. so there status all across the arab world actually went up their leader nasrullah became the most popular arab figure in the region mm -hmm. so they have never espoused a sectarian approach it has been a national approach defending the rights of lebanon so this sectarian structure that has been given a to what the era to what the iranians are doing mm -hmm. and b to see in this a certain threat and alarm in riyadh is i think misplaced and misconceived so how do you think now uh, that saudi arabia and the four country have taken such a strong stance can they roll back or i mean what how do you see it basically uh, you know uh, going ahead in the next few days or next few weeks i am very um, concerned and very deeply worried i don't think it will pan out in the next few days or the next few weeks i think it's a longer term i have been fervently hoping mm. for the last 2 years and more that something should happen some diplomatic initiative mm. should be mounted to reconcile these two estranged islamic giants mm. i've been wanting this for a long time but instead of my wish being fulfilled i have seen the exact opposite happen so that year upon year month upon month i see the relationship deteriorating mm. i feel that the trump intervention mm. has ensured mm. that the sense of tension the sense of competition the sense of rivalry will actually remain with us for some more time because there is no ground now this the 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 saudis completely comfortable with the fact that the that the americans are with them right. and the suggestion that the americans may be willing to intervene militarily on the saudi side in syria and in yemen mm. and that they will actively subvert iran mm. uh, at home to effect regime change why should the saudis feel any need for a peace process now we also seeing pictures of uh, you know panic buying in qatar so how can how long do you think the qatari regime can also withstand the pressure i agree with you uh, that is another area of very deep concern mm -hmm. that it's the saudis now flexing their muscles mm -hmm. the muscles that have been strengthened by trump mm -hmm. the trump intervention is what i would suggest is at the heart of everything that is seriously going wrong in the region i am mm. not going to suggest to you that pre president obama promoted stability mm. but the fact you cannot take away two facts from his mm. uh, from his uh, regime number one he robustly promoted the peace pro uh, he i mean he he then promoted the nuclear agreement mm. and number two he refused to intervene militarily in the other trouble spots in the region where well, syria and in the case of yemen he denied saudi arabia precision munitions mm -hmm. which could be which could be used to devastating effect mm -hmm. in the region mm -hmm. he also refused to do the massive bombings of iraq mm -hmm. and syria that uh, the trump administration has done so i would there was a certain he did not 
go forward with regard to the bilateral relationship with with Iran but at least he was a force for some degree of moderation and good sense in the region i think all of that has now been abandoned by the trump administration so in that sense uh, uh, i expect that since us is already giving i mean like you said they they feel that they have a carte blanche from the us the saudis so right now the qatari foreign minister has offered talks you don't expect any much of a uh, ultimately response from the ultimately there will be some degree some reconciliation there will be qatar is too small too isolated to be able to sustain itself over the long period mm -hmm. also we cannot ignore the fact that these gcc countries are very closely enmeshed with each other mm -hmm. they have familial links marital links economic links cultural links social links they move across borders freely all the time i cannot imagine that qatar's maverick posture mm -hmm. is sustainable the pressure mounted against it and the powerful coalition that is arranged against it mm. is too powerful for a country that has a total of 300000 people uh, and 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 an armed force of 11000 and an american presence that is meant to protect it as well as ensure us interests in the region uh, for about 10000 So, for the uh, Saudi alliance, if I may say, which is the most important thing that they want from Qatar, which is most important, is they it want, Iran? Is it they want Muslim Qatar, Brotherhood? They want Qatar to become part of the regional strategic structure mm -hmm. that the Trump administration and the kingdom have put in place. Mm -hmm. Hostility to Iran, mm -hmm. hostility to the Muslim Brotherhood, mm -hmm. and a partnership. in the islamic alliance led by saudi so it has to be all these issues they cannot total. be uh, total. one or two or total uh, okay. no no compromise on this mm -hmm. so qatar should become part of the gcc family once again mm -hmm. see the problem was that qatar is overt mm -hmm. oman also has similar positions mm -hmm. is in fact much more vulnerable economically and politically as compared to qatar mm -hmm. but in the case of oman they do things discreetly is it because of the personality of the leaders uh, see it was a scenario even when uh, when his highness's father mm. was the ruler qatar has been unique mm. people uh, commentators and observers are very bewildered mm. we find it very difficult to explain qatar and no simplistic explanation is good enough earlier i used to feel and i'm going to share this with you is a personal view that when qatar reached out to the brotherhood and reached out to the morsi government in egypt i thought that they were playing the long term american game mm -hmm. at that time the us administration was very clear that the future of a reformed west asia mm -hmm. would have a significant place for the brotherhood the brotherhood was a political organization it was in many countries an enlightened organization it was a very flexible organization and i think that the americans while reluctant to do anything on their own at that time at the beginning of the arab spring were quite happy if their interest was projected by a surrogate role player right. in this case qatar is this the scenario today itself as well is qatar by promoting reconciliation with iran mm -hmm. by creating certain issues with regard to the trump administration is it subserving some sections of the united states administration that may not be comfortable with uh, with the trump mm -hmm. with trump personally but would also be extremely uncomfortable with the near total breakdown of relationship between saudi arabia and iran mm -hmm. it is too early for us to come to any conclusive view in this regard but the feeling that qatar 
might be projecting an interest beyond the confines of the island nation itself mm -hmm. that a larger role player and a larger influence mm -hmm. might be a factor in some of its positions public positions cannot be ruled out mm -hmm. but at this stage i cannot be more clear than this because do recall mm -hmm. the amir of qatar said he has good relations with the united states he has good relations with israel mm -hmm. so he has said this that and they are anxious that the whole region of west asia should be a region of people of countries working with each other economically and politically and therefore there can be no scope in this no space in this for conflict now this is their ideal as articulated by their rulers over the last several years that they want a scenario which includes Uh, which includes israel not in not israel as a source of conflict in the region but an israel that is a very uh, that is a part of reconciliation of engagement of dialogue of mutual political cooperation you i recall that uh, that the present ruler's father was appalled at what the israelis had wreaked the havoc they had wreaked in, uh, they had wreaked in gaza and though he had a close relationship with the israelis he articulated he went to gaza and articulated his deep seated concern at the destruction that had been had that had been done and very strongly spoke out about the need for reconciliation mm -hmm. and recognition of palestinian interests so yes i do believe that there is an element of idealism in the qatari presentation but unfortunately in the present scenario in west asia there is no room for accommodation for moderation or for idealism can we now just go uh, and talk about the implications for india because we have such a large population and has we have important links economically and uh, for energy security yesterday you must have heard uh, what the external affairs minister uh, sushma swaraj had said that this is not a basically a major challenge for us unless we have indian citizens who are stranded due to the snapping of transportation ties i want to go a little beyond mm -hmm. uh, the external affairs minister's remarks india has every reason to be very deeply concerned mm -hmm. about the deteriorating security situation in west asia and the and the scenario of confrontation and conflict mm. that you see across the gulf waters mm. between saudi arabia and iran india has every reason to be concerned india gets 80% of its oil mm. from this region mm. india also has very strong economic ties with the region india has an 8 million strong community in the region whose safety welfare is our Uh, is very important to us but it is also a community that remits to india every year 35 billion dollars mm -hmm. india has also uh, envisaged mm -hmm. very strong logistical connectivities through iran mm -hmm. to afghanistan central asia and russia mm -hmm. which are extremely important for our strategic uh, interest mm -hmm. we cannot sit back and confine ourselves mm. to the limits of south asia mm. when our neighborhood is a flame mm. i would not be astonished if this kind of adverse rhetoric mm. of abuse of sectarian abuse mm. the massive arming of saudi arabia on the one hand and the sense of existential threat that the saudis sense mm. cannot direct conflict take already proxy conflicts are taking place in three theaters mm -hmm. in uh, syria and in yemen mm -hmm. and in iraq mm -hmm. are we so complacent that you will not have a direct uh, conflict between them conflicts are not preplanned very often major conflicts are not preplanned mm -hmm. there is a serious misunderstanding about the intentions of the other mm -hmm. which encourages one side to carry out preemptive strike it happened you know how the first world war started not a single major country thought that the first world war is going to carry on for 5 years 
they did not think that uh, the 1967 war is a product of bluff on the part of uh, of of president nasser right. but the israelis genuinely believed that they might be attacked yeah. so they did a preemptive assault mm -hmm. i am deeply concerned india cannot have the economic prosperity the growth rates the welfare of its citizens if west asia goes up in flames so should we do anything politically of course the time is over mm -hmm. up to now what we were what Obama called fence sisters. Mm -hmm. But his criticism was unfair. Mm -hmm. Why was it unfair? Because the Americans never let anyone else come into the region. Right. That situation has changed today. Mm -hmm. The Americans under Obama were no longer involved with the region. Mm -hmm. The Americans under Trump are destroying the region. Mm -hmm. Are we going to sit by? The Americans don't need Gulf oil. But they don't have 8 million people. But the major uh, focus of our of our policy, Gulf policy, as articulated by Mrs. Mrs. Swaraj yesterday, was that we balance all the powers, that we have good relations. Absolutely with correct, and that is why that is our strength. Mm -hmm. What is the role that I have envisaged for India? Mm -hmm. the, it is a diplomatic initiative. Mm -hmm. It is a diplomatic initiative to bring the two contending powers to the negotiating table. That's all. Mm -hmm. We have. If you read the documents that our Prime Minister signed mm. in Riyadh and in Tehran, mm. in Doha and in Abu Dhabi, and the document that was signed in Delhi at mm. Republic Day, on Republic Day, mm. each and every one of them mm. speaks of an Indian security role Absolutely. in the region, mm. a role that is insisted on mm. by the countries of the region. Mm. If you recall the joint state, there, there was a joint article that Prime Minister Modi and His Highness the Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi wrote, which appeared in all the Indian newspapers and UAE newspapers on Republic Day. Yeah. Look at the second paragraph. Mm -hmm. The second paragraph says that we are we will work together, not just bilaterally, but to promote peace and security in the region as a whole. Can I take, if there is any time, I would like to take two questions from readers. Um, one is basically, um, this is a question which has been asked actually uh, again and again and one is uh, this is from mr r khan um, he has written to us basically if you can shed some light on the saudi funding of isis to turkey and jordan and uh, because they have been talking uh, they have been accusing let me clarify the situation let me clarify the situation saudi arabia did not fund mm -hmm. the islamic state of iraq and syria right. But there is well-documented evidence that certain GCC countries did support Abu Musab Zarqawi when he was the head of the Al-Qaeda in Iraq mm -hmm. and led the Sunni insurrection against Shia empowerment in Iraq. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt about that. Mm -hmm. It is well-documented and all the literature of that period speaks of this. It is accepted. That is the first point. Zarqawi's outfit mm -hmm. evolved into first the Islamic State of Iraq mm -hmm. and then the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria mm -hmm. in 2011, 10 years after 9-11. Uh, mm -hmm. There is no evidence of continued Saudi funding after Zarqawi had been killed. There is no evidence mm -hmm. and it's not so there is no point in finger pointing. Mm -hmm. But yes, the GCC countries did support mm -hmm. the grandfather of the Islamic State. Zarqawi. That is the first point. Now we come to Turkey. Mm -hmm. Turkey encouraged the movement of jihadis from across its border mm -hmm. to into Syria mm -hmm. for two to three years. Mm -hmm. The route that was taken was called the Jihadi Superhighway. And thousands and thousands of jihadis from the Gulf countries and from European countries used this superhighway. Initially, they joined the various Salafi militia, but later on, many of them joined the Islamic State. Mm -hmm. So, yes, you can say Turkey played a role in promoting the Islamic State. Why did Turkey do that? Turkey wanted to encourage the Islamic State at that time because they were fighting the Kurds. Right. So they thought 
that the Islamic State is a lethal weapon against Kurdish aggrandizement in Syria. It did not help because the Kurds expanded their territory in any case. So what Turkey has recently done is a major somersault because Turkey has now left the South robustly. They will find that the Kurds will have an enclave at the Syria-Turkish border which is linked with, with the Kurdish territories in Iraq. So you will already have a nascent state. The third, unfortunately, certain GCC countries are said to have used Al-Qaeda in Syria, which is known as Jabhat Nusra, against the Syrian armed forces. So yes, a certain amount of cooperation, operational, certain amount of funding, certain amount of provision of weaponry mm -hmm. has taken place in Syria, which has bolstered an Al-Qaeda organization. There is also widespread writing in the media that certain sections of the GCC have been supportive of Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula and have not been averse to using Al-Qaeda against the Houthis mm -hmm. on the sectarian basis. What does all this tell us? I have to say something with deep regret. Jihadis benefit from state sponsorship. They do not, they do not grow on their own. It is behind every jihadi organization. Go back, Al-Qaeda. United States, Saudi Arabia and Pakistan sponsored Al-Qaeda in the Afghan struggle. They created a national movement into a global jihad. From there you find Al-Qaeda. You find Pakistan give sanctuary to Jihad, to Taliban and Al-Qaeda and, and the rest I have told you. As a balancing question, sh I should also ask that what is your assessment or the Indian government assessments of Qatar's uh, links with extremist organization and how, how much support do There is not enough. See, there is a lot of writing. Mm -hmm. But the sources are dubious. The sources are dubious. They come from extreme right-wing Zionist organizations in the United States, including the FDD, uh, who constantly bring this into the public domain from time to time. But if that was the case, why would the United States have such solid political and military ties with Qatar? But would they have a base there? They have their base there. Mm -hmm. So I am I am skeptical. Mm -hmm. See, you can make loose remarks about anybody. You do. You should be able to offer proof, and that proof should be then something that you can take to your interlocutor and bring it to the attention of the interlocutor and say you should correct your conduct. Mm. In the case of Qatar, nobody has said that the government is funding. Mm. What they are saying is certain private elements, mm. private sources are funding certain extremist organizations. They want the Qatar government to be much more active in mm. controlling their activity. But this they have said not just about Qatar. With deep respect, I must point out, this has been said about other GCC countries as well. Okay. You know, you have today American officials mm. sitting in the central banks of many of these mm. countries. These countries have pledged to control uh, financing of terror. They have, in fact, President Bush inaugurated one such institution, uh, which is uh, very important, which is a consensually supported institution to control financing of terror. The financing of terror is not something that you can easily turn the tap off. Mm -hmm. There are many ways. The A globalized financial sector uh, structure allows for a lot of movement of funds, mm -hmm. overwhelmingly legitimate. Mm -hmm. A small degree of illegitimate transactions also take place. Mm -hmm. Also, you know that terrorism is funded uh, not through, you know, through sale of drugs, sale of armaments, human trafficking. Mm -hmm. So you have a whole subterranean network of illicit activity that also gets channeled into funding certain organizations. But for a fairly long time, the Islamic State has not needed external funding mm -hmm. because they had control over the certain oil. Resor oil resources, got a lot of money mm -hmm. from uh, uh, from ransom. Mm -hmm. One of the criticisms that has been lodged against Saudi, against Qatar mm -hmm. is that it played, paid a very large sum of money to get certain hostages released mm -hmm. in Syria 
and in uh, Afghanistan very recently. And very large sums of are being mentioned. And it is suggested that a large portion of this money also went to Iran. But there is no proof of this. Yeah, this is just being, Financial Times. These are just being said. These are reports. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm right, I can say somebody has said this. These are of dubious origin. Dubious origin as of today. Thank you, Mr. Tehmer, Ahmed, for really, you know, expanding and our knowledge about this region and exhaustively explaining the background and history of the Thank conflict you. in Thank the region. You. I hope you can come back again and talk Thank you. and take, perhaps we could take more questions next time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. All the best to you. Thanks.